So yesterday wasn't recorded, so we're going to repeat uh, the lines that were laid out yesterday. Um, the repeating pattern, the light of Moses, and I want to add a couple of other thoughts to that. Uh, we want to demonstrate how we see the current arguments prophetically. So part of this will be revision uh, with some, I, I guess, clearer and added information. Kneel with me, we'll open in prayer. Amen. A couple of preliminary thoughts. Already through the movement we can see uh, some information being shared. Some of what has come to my attention, I would like to mention just as an example of what I already see taking place. Some stories already spreading, already being promoted. Uh, I'll just mention one. The comment or thought being shared among some that I am asking people to now call me elder. I don't recall ever doing that, not before or after the events of this week, have I ever asked or uh, suggested or pressured or implied that anyone needs to refer to me as elder. But already the, the, the false information that I'm asking for that is already being disseminated. I think it's an interesting example of how um, people are currently choosing to frame recent events and the current one that we're, we're in now. I, I want to use that as an example to show how already um, those opposing what is currently taking place in the movement are choosing to argue their position. And I want to encourage people when they see rumours such as that being disseminated that at least everyone in this room who has had interaction with me this week and hopefully the other 200 people at this camp meeting have never heard that from my mouth. So wherever this story is coming from, which as far as I'm aware are not people who have been here this last uh, week or at least those that have had interaction with me, um, I'd encourage people to question those stories before accepting them but it shows what we're up against and the direction this is heading. The second point I made yesterday, I want to repeat. The, li the lines that I want to lay out now uh, in this presentation are not ones that have been studied out in the last couple of days. They're not recent studies. Throughout the year, I've in, sp in spare time been considering some of these things. Some of them have already worked their way into presentations. Uh, some of them have not, but they've been at the back of my mind. Not, to, not that I ever considered an application for them. I never saw their relevancy connected to uh, the test of this year. But I find at this point in time, they, they suddenly become take on a relevancy. So that they're, they're not studies that are necessarily, that I was necessarily planning to share or present in the immediate future. 
Um, but I believe the current course of events necessitates that. A couple were, have already been um, shared in previous camp meetings or schools. Some of the things that I want to share have already been um, worked into the Midnight Cry message, not to make an application, but just because at that time I found them of interest. I never had any specific agenda to mention them or to include them in the message, except that the pattern of events made their relevancy uh, unavoidable. And I always believed that the application of them would come at some time. We discussed, have been discussing through the year, this idea of a repeating pattern. We understand that we have four dispensations in our, in our reform line. Each dispensation carries these same characteristics and this is something Elder Paminda began this morning by, by sharing. That you would have a message unsealed. There would be an increase of knowledge on that message. A formalisation of that message. And at the formalisation, testing process begins that ends where you would mark a shut door. Whatever you chose to call that. So this is the repeating pattern we find in every dispensation along our reform line. So you could say 1989, there's an increase of knowledge. 1991, formalised 1996, shut door 9-11. You repeat it. 9-11, 25-20 unsealed. Increase of knowledge, 2009. Formalised, 2012, a message of time. A testing process to 2014, shut door. 2014, a message is unsealed, leads to an increase of knowledge, 2016, Acts 27. Formalised 2018, the midnight cry message, leading to a testing period from October last year to November of this year, shut door. So this is the repeating pattern we find within our reform line. And it's this formalisation and this test that I want to highlight. So if we were to construct our reform line, and as we saw this morning, you would see that it, it exists in four dispensations. 1989, 9-11, 2014, 2019, Panium. And you can do a great deal with this concept of a reform line. Um, I've begun to share the idea that this, these five way marks, these four histories, if you go into verses um, that state that God leads out his people, he, he restores his people, gathers his people with his right hand. And I've suggested that this is representative of a hand. You have five way marks, five fingers, four dispensations, four spaces. So 1989, 9-11, 2014, 2019, Panium. Or 1989, 9-11, Sunday Law, Close of Probation, Second Advent. Five way marks, four histories, four dispensations. The middle way mark is the way mark of Sunday law. It's midway, it's midnight, it's the middle finger. So you, you, you can draw a parallel to a hand. It, it makes it more simpler to remember if, if, if you're like me and you need visual help. So 1989 to 9-11, two way marks in between. Increase of knowledge and a formalisation. And this is the history of a test. 
And we know that this occurs in each one of these dispensations. So this, is, this isn't new. We've been teaching this through the year. And I want to make the point now about particularly this history. We're going to have a, a, a brief look at that. But we come to this formalization and there's a message. We discussed this morning the concept of half right and half wrong the degree to which you can trust this message. Time of the End magazine, uh, the message of time setting, the Mid Midnight Cry message. What I've begun to share through the year, I, I can't remember the exact lake locations that I did it. I'm not sure why, but in my mind I did it in Holland. I, I, I can't remember the exact places, but I'm, I know that it's been at least twice, in at least Two of the locations visited this year, this concept was shared. And that was that this test that begins at the formalization and extends to the shut door, that this test is twofold in nature. So this test comes in two parts. The first, the first test, it relates to the message. So in 1996, at this formalization, people are tested. And to keep it simple, I will say that that test was on Daniel 11, 40 to 45. That's the message test of 1996. 2012, there's another message test. 2012, this is the message of time setting. Two thousand and eighteen, there's another message test. I'm going to simplify it by saying two streams of information. I think you can say that because you can put a lot of subheadings under two streams of information. The other part of what the other element that has been, sh has been shared at least twice this year is that there is a second test. And that conclusion was come to by observing this repeating pattern of 1996 and 2012. If you're in a church in 1996, you're in an Adventist church pew, someone comes you, to you with a Time of the End magazine, you're presented with a series of truths, particularly Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And you have a twofold test. First of all, you're going to look at the logic presented. You're going to look at the message and say, do I or do I not agree with this, with this definition of these verses, 40 to 45? So you're tested on the message. At the same time, you face another test. And that is a test of leadership or organization. And you're tested in this history when you hear that there is this message being shared. There is a test. Listen to the leadership, Elder Jeff, or to your church structure. So it's a twofold test here. You accept or reject the message, but you could accept this message and reject that there is a new leadership. You could reject the leadership of the movement. And if you fail that, whatever your views of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, you're not going to become part of this movement. Two thousand and twelve. I want to make the point, we can bring to this reform line, our reform line, many others. I'm going to use the Millerites because it is the most, the most clear, but we're going to look at other ones. 2014 is Sunday Law, 
Sunday Law is July 21st. The Boston Camp Meeting. And we, in Millerite history, we discuss two messengers raised up. The first is William Miller. Raised up at the time of the end. William Miller is raised up. 1798 to July 21st, 1844. And at this point of July 21st, we find another voice that the movement is required to hear and follow. We know William Miller has not accepted that, but regardless, they're required, salvationly required, to hear the second voice and listen to him. And this is Samuel Snow. So we're talking about the first messenger in 19, the history of 1989 to 2014, or 1798 to July 21st, 1844, Boston. And then Samuel Snow from July 21st. The reason I mention that now, because I want us to see in 2012 who the leadership is. In 2012, the leadership is still William Miller or Elder Jeff. So the test, the test of time setting in 2012 comes from another voice. But we have more than one parable story to, re to explain this history. And the test of leadership is recognising the leader of the moment, Elder Jeff Pippinger, against... Path of the Just. So again, there's a test of a message, time setting, but separate to the test of a message is a test of leadership, organisation, whether or not people can identify the leaders of the movement. We come to 2018, and when I've shared it in the past, that's as far as I've gotten because I've had no reason to define it other than to identify the repeating pattern. There is the message, two streams of information, but now there must also be a test of leadership. We understand that in this history, from July 21st or 2014 forward, there is a new leadership raised up. In this history... Elder Parminder and myself. You can leave me out of that if you like. You know from 2014 who shared that message. The mantle was thrown. So Elder Parminder and myself becoming from 2014 forward that leadership. So if this pattern is to repeat, then this must also be repeated. And here it isn't just an individual it's not just one person that's challenging the leadership of the movement. You have a structure that's standing in opposition. The Adventist structure, path of the just, they're a structure. So when we come to our history, there must therefore be a structure opposing the voices of leadership. I would suggest this is where we're currently at. It's a repeating pattern. And you know that in this history, from 2018 October to November, which is only two months away, that this pattern must be repeated. And this is what falls into that category at the moment. So we have the leader of the dispensation opposed by a structure. 2012, the leadership of the dispensation opposed by a structure. In our history, the leaders of the dispensation opposed by a structure. I want to remind us just how many lines we've used throughout the year to defend this position. I'm not sure who watched the meetings in Portugal. If you did, it was done more clearly in Portugal than anywhere else, the compare and the contrast of the internal and the external. Date after date, 
From this point forward, we compared and contrasted internal and external. We brought clear, parable methodology to understanding the role of the second messenger. And a whole line was, was drawn from this history all the way to 2019 that compared and contrasted the role and work of Donald Trump with Elder Parminda. And I want to remind us of that, not to repeat the study, but for those of you have what, who have watched that, to be reminded just how strong that logic was. To see that in 2009, if any of you want to photograph it in the break, that's a structure. In external and internal, 10 different way marks lining up the, the parallels between an external and an internal leader being raised up. 2009. Trump changes his party affiliation to Republican. 2009. Elder Parminder presents the 2520 series in Arkansas. The key that the 2520, the 2520 revealed. Going to skip 2011, 2012. We already speak about, um, we do other lines to understand the role of Cambridge Analytica and their parent company, SCL. Comes from the UK into the United States, 2012. It's the message of time. It comes from the UK into the United States, 2013, enemies, externally, Snowden, 2013, inter internally, enemies, path of the just, 2014, you can add so much to that way, Mark, Cambridge Analytica does their work, you see the coming together, we, we've spoken a great deal at the camp meeting about the Sunday law characteristics of 2014. 2014 internally, a message is unlocked. We also have Ezra 7.9. 2015, Donald Trump announces his candidacy. So Donald Trump says he's running for president. He begins his campaign. He begins sharing his Donald Trump message throughout the United States. 2015, Elder Parminda begins teaching. Two thousand and sixteen. Trump is elected. Two thousand and sixteen. Elder Parminda is anointed. Two thousand and eighteen. There's a lot that happens this year that we haven't had time to go over. We have Heraclea, we have Trump bowing to the evangelicals, the evangelical leaders. We have Fahrenheit 11.9 and we have the Midnight Cry message. You can draw other lines that illustrate Elder Jeff as fulfilling the role of Donald Trump or Obama and you can switch it depending on the application. We spoke about Abraham Lincoln, how he wears two hats depending on which of the parables you're choosing to illustrate. In this history, we're seeing the rising up of another leader. And this is done briefly as a reminder for all of those who have watched Portugal. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to go back and watch Portugal and see the strength of compare and contrast, that we can take the rising up of an external leader with the rising up of an internal leader. And we know that Donald Trump goes all the way to the end. If you want to be part of their end time movement in the United States, you need to be on the side of Donald Trump. If you want to be on the right side of the internal movement, the final movement, God's movement, you need to be on the right side of the here anointed leadership. 
It's that that we're illustrating in this history, this 2014 switch. But you can see it from back from this dispensation. I believe Elder Paminder has already shared the logic of the messenger of each dispensation. 1989 to 911, Elder Jeff. 911 to 2014, the 2520 revealed the message of time setting. Elder Palminder. 2014 to 2019, Acts 27, the midnight cry message. But I want us to identify the two layers to that history. Elder Jeff is the leader of the movement identified on a reform line from 1989 to 2014. You can see that layer. 2014, there's a switch in leadership. The same time you have two dispensations. The message in this history, the messenger bringing that unsealed increase of light is Elder Jeff. The increase of light in this history, Elder Paminder, which is why you have this two parts to this test. Time setting, the person who brings the message. Leadership, Elder Jeff. We're okay with that. I'll repeat it one more time, then I'm going to erase the board to lay out some more lines. Two parts to the test. A message, increase of light, and a test of leadership. 1989 to 911, the message comes from Elder Jeff. This dispensation, he's the one that takes that increase of light and shares it. But you also must recognise the leadership. This dispensation, Elder Paminda receives the light, time setting, and he shares it. But it's also this dispensation of leadership, Elder Jeff or William Miller from these dates. And in this history... You can see the repeating pattern. Message and a test of leadership. Message and a test of leadership between October 2018 and November 2019. Do you have anything you want to add? So I want to erase this and add some more reform lines to our structure if you want to. I understand this study of compare and contrast has been done in brief. It was laid out more slowly in Portugal, but, but I'm not aware of anywhere else it was done thoroughly. Okay, if I, I will erase. The reason that I also touched on this other compare and contrast of the internal external is to remind people of just how much weight of evidence has been built over this course of this year to defend our current understanding, not at all of which can be repeated in today's study. In 1989, there's an increase of knowledge. And at that first point, 1989, what begins to open up? First point, 1989. My understanding was that it was reform lines. The basis of everything we're studying, these reform lines. So I want us to consider some reform lines. These are the same basic to this movement, foundational reform lines that we've been studying from the very beginning. I want us to remember that point. The same foundational reform lines. These are not new reform lines. We're going to look at Moses, Christ 
and the Millerites, not bringing any new line to this. We want to go to those same lines that began to open up in 1989 and see what they teach us about the course of this, of the line of the priests. So again, to remind you, these are not thoughts that I, I have or we have considered in the last two days. These are thoughts that have been developing over the course of the year. We looked, we have looked at the line of Moses. I want to suggest right from the start that I don't mean to undo any previous work on the reform line. Somebody else can go and see whether or not they, um, our old understanding could be refined. What I am suggesting is over the last couple of years, we've had a much greater refinement of our, our, the understanding of our own reform line. So we have understood in more and more detail the line of the 144,000 and its subsequent three fractals. So we've been able to build the 144,000 line, 1989 to the second advent. We understood this, this main structure, but then within this, we also identified fractals. So we have the line of the priests. The line of the Levites. The line of the Nethanims. all as fractals of the greater line. So our understanding of the line of the 144,000 has grown significantly. What has not been thoroughly done is go back to those foundational reform lines of Moses, Christ and the Millerites and brought them up to speed with this understanding. So if this is what the reform line of the Alpha history of modern Israel looks like. What do you think the Alpha, sorry, the Omega history of modern Israel looks like this, yes? yes? So the Omega history of ancient Israel looks like what? Same. Has to look the same. So when we do construct a line and we say, talk about the cross, where would you place the cross? First of all, tell me which line. Nethanims, Levites, priests, 144,000. Where do you want to place the cross? Go to the line of the priest. 144,000. Sunday law. Okay, I want to make a suggestion. If you put the cross at Sunday law, what do they do after the cross? They go into the upper room, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then go, who do they go and talk to? Levites. Levites. They go back to the church. So the cross cannot be this. The cross has to be before. So the cross, I want to suggest, does not exist on the line of 144,000. If you were to, to overlay the reform line of Christ and the reform line of the 144,000, the cross would not even show up. Because at Sunday law, at 9-11 there's baptism, and at Sunday law they're taking a message to Gentiles, so where's the cross? Our understanding of these reform lines has to catch up to our increase of knowledge on the line of 144,000. Can we all see that? So if what I lay out now looks different, it's because we're looking at this at a different scale. I want to approach the reform lines from this scale, from the largest overall structure. If we can see the, the overall framework of the reform lines of Moses and Christ and the Millerites, then we can go down and construct the smaller fractals. We shouldn't construct a smaller fractal 
and then build the largest reform line. But you know in Christ's history, they go to three groups. They go to the church, draw out disciples, go to the church again at Pentecost, and then go to the Gentiles, three groups. So you know the reform line of Christ is repeating this same pattern. So when we think about where we're going to place a waymark, we need to consider it on this level, 144,000 level. So I don't mean when I do these lines to build the whole structure. I just want to lay enough here for you to see what we're doing, trust in it because of what we already know and then make a couple of applications. Is that clear? So we'll, we'll go back to Moses. I want to remind us this is Moses. This is the Alpha of ancient Israel. Moses, the Alpha history of ancient Israel, and therefore, if it's an Alpha history, what is it? It's a history of failure. Because if the Alpha history worked, there would be no Omega. We understand the time of the end to be marked by the birth of Moses. And there's an increase of knowledge. From the birth of Moses to the Red Sea, God is leading out of people. He's leading a people out of captivity. They come to the Red Sea. They're facing a sea. They have their enemies behind them. And I just want to quote from Patriarchs and Prophets 287.2. As Moses stretched out his rod, the waters parted, and Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, while the waters stood like a wall upon each side. The light from God's pillar of fire shone upon the foam-capped billows and lighted the road that was cut like a mighty furrow through the waters of the sea and was lost in the obscurity of the farther shore. So they face the sea, they're tested, they can see the water in front of them and here it's Moses that does all the work. He raises up his rod and the waters part. So this is the work of Moses. Parts the waters by lifting up his rod. We understand that we can mark baptism at this way, Mark. I think our brother mentioned that. Uh, before and also if you were to go to Exodus 14 21 Exodus 14 21 and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. All I want to pick up from there is the Lord causes the sea to go back by a strong east wind. So here we're marking 9-11. Time of the end, 9-11, God has led out of people. They cross the sea. And we find that God wants to give them his law. I want to suggest at this point, we know that they go into the wilderness. And God begins to give them his law. 
I want to suggest that as the foundations. But as God is giving them his law, the people are troubled. Patriarchs and Prophets 315.1 While Moses was absent, it was a time of waiting and suspense to Israel. During this period of waiting, there was time for them to meditate upon the law of God. So at this point in time, you also see a tarrying. So you can see how we're overlaying symbols. I'm sure there's many more symbols you can lay to this reform line. But those symbols are more like details. What we should be seeing is stepping right back and looking at the overall structure. What has God led them out to do? Go into Canaan and conquer it. That's their mission. So God has led out a people for a purpose. And you know that that conquering is their purpose, yes? So we shouldn't be marking way marks like Sunday law before they enter Canaan, unless we're looking at a fractal. We know we need to expand it out. If we're going to see them do a work, it has to be in the history of conquering. So the Red Sea, 9-11. Foundations, the giving of the law. They wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then we see Moses strikes a rock. He went against the directive of God. He struck the rock. Because of this mistake, he was not permitted to lead the people over the River Jordan. As a result of the striking of the rock, there was to be a change in leadership. Between this history, Moses striking the rock and this change of leadership, in this history, we also see apostasy. Patriarchs and Prophets 456.1. Apostasy at the Jordan. The judgments visited upon Israel for their sin destroyed the survivors of that vast company who nearly 40 years before had incurred the sentence, they shall surely die in the wilderness. The numbering of the people by God's direction during their encampment on the plains of Jordan showed them that of them whom Moses and Aaron the priests numbered, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai, there was not left a man of them save Caleb the son of Jephunai, Jephunai and Joshua the son of Nun. That's quoting Numbers 26, 64 and 65. So I want to identify that in this history there's apostasy and as a result of this apostasy you only have two standing, Joshua and Caleb. All the other adults who'd crossed the Red Sea and come out of Egypt were all destroyed in the wilderness because of these apostasies. We have Moses striking the rock and due to that there's going to be a change in leadership. Patriarchs and Prophets 462.4 and the ongoing paragraphs.
the Lord hearkened to the prayer of his servant, to Moses, and the answer came, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. Joshua had long attended Moses, and being a man of wisdom, ability, and faith, he was chosen to succeed him. Through the laying on of hands by Moses, accompanied by a most impressive charge, Joshua was solemnly set apart as the leader of Israel. He was also admitted to a present share in the government. The words of the Lord concerning Joshua came through Moses to the congregation. He shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. The great ruler of nations had declared that Moses was not to lead the congregation of Israel into the goodly land. At the divine command, Moses and Joshua repaired to the tabernacle while the pillar of cloud came and stood over the door. Here the people were solemnly committed to the charge of Joshua. The work of Moses as leader of Israel was ended. So you have the striking of the rock, the mistake of the leader. You have a transfer of leadership. It was someone who had already been associated with Moses. He was admitted to a present share in the government. And he's declared, it is declared that due to Moses' error, he would not be permitted to lead Israel over Jordan. We can work backwards to do this. We know that they've been led out of Egypt for a purpose and that purpose is to conquer. We were led out at 1989 and that purpose was to evangelize or conquer, to take over the glorious land, to be raised up as a new leadership. And that work begins at Jericho. Our work begins when? Panium. So you know that Jordan precedes Panium, the crossing of the Jordan. We can, we can bookend this history very nicely with 9 11 and 2019. Nine eleven, eleven nine. All different ways you can start to bookend this history. But we have Red Sea, the crossing of the sea, the crossing of the Jordan. It's a test and a test. So we already can identify, based on this change of leadership, that the leader raised up here, Moses, is not permitted, not authorised to lead the people over Jordan. Through the laying on of hands by Moses, accompanied by a most impressive charge, Joshua was solemnly set apart as the leader of Israel. The great ruler of nations had declared that Moses was not to lead the congregation of Israel into the goodly land. So we have a change from one leader to another leader as a result of the striking of the rock. At this apostasy, and I'm marking this as we did before as 2014, as this apostasy, I would define path of the just, the fallout in this history with time setting, all of those issues, the rejection of the message of this dispensation. By the time you get to 2014, very few people that had crossed the Red Sea are still in the movement. They all died in the wilderness. Joshua was now the acknowledged leader of Israel. He had been known chiefly as a warrior. And what are they about to do? Conquer. And his gifts and virtues were especially valuable at this stage in the history of his people. So if they're going to conquer, 
they need a leader known as a warrior. During the sojourn in the wilderness, he had played a part in the government. He's already been part of the system. Deuteronomy 34, 4 and 5. This history right here. And the Lord said unto him, to Moses, this is the land which I swore unto Abraham. So he can see ahead. He can see what's about to happen. And God tells him, this is the land I swore to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to your children. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you will not go there. Verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. <coughs> Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses." There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. So over and over, God tells Joshua and the people. He tells Joshua and the people, as I was with Moses, so I will be with Joshua. As I was with the first leader, so will I be with the second leader. It's before Jordan that the death of Moses sparks this transition. It's only at his death that they cross Jordan. By the river of Jordan, the priests are without Moses. Arrangements are now made for crossing the Jordan. This is Signs of the Times, April 7. Signs of the Times, April 7, 1881, 1881, beginning at paragraph 4. Arrangements are now made for crossing the Jordan. The people prepared a three-day supply of food and the men of war made ready for battle. So what are they making ready for? Ready for battle. And the battle is our mission. It's what their mission was to conquer the glorious land. Our mission is to conquer the glorious land using different weapons. So at this point in time, right up to the crossing of the Jordan, they're preparing for that work. All heartily acquiesced in the plans of their leader and assured him of their confidence and support, quoting them, All that thou commandest us we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses, who, whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of a good courage. But all well knew that without divine aid they could not hope to make the passage. At this time of the year, in their spring season, the melting snows of the mountains had so raised the Jordan that the river overflowed its banks, making it impossible to cross at the usual fording places. God willed that the passage of the Israelites over Jordan should be miraculous. Joshua commanded the people to sanctify themselves, for upon the morrow the Lord would do wonders among them. At the appointed time, he directed the priests to take up the ark containing the law of God and bear it before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, 
This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. He continues to repeat this thought, as with the first leader, so God is with the second. The river is overflowing its banks. It's the most dangerous time of the year to attempt a crossing. The priests obeyed the commands of their leader and went before the people carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The immense hosts watched with deep interest as the priests advanced down the bank of the Jordan. They saw them, the people saw them, the priests, with the sacred ark, move steadily forward towards the angry surging stream till the feet of the bearers seemed to be dipping into the waters. Then suddenly the current was borne back while the tide below swept on and the deep bed of the Jordan was laid bare. At the divine command, the priests descended to the middle of the channel and stood there while the great multitudes advanced and crossed to the farther side. Thus was impressed upon the minds of all Israel the fact that the power which stayed the waters of Jordan was the same that opened the Red Sea before their fathers 40 years before. So the same way God led the first leader, the same he leads the second. As God was with Moses, so he will be with Joshua. The same power that parted the Red Sea parts, parts the rivers of Jordan. If you know where you've come from, you know the surety of where you're going. You know the safety in following the movement. But there's a subtle difference. As they cross the Jordan, what must the priesthood do? First, they must understand they are not listening to the voice of Moses. He cannot take them over this way mark. It must be the second leader. Second, they have confidence in their leader that he is being led by God just as was Moses. And third, there's a step of faith. Forty years before, God did not require of them much faith. They're babies. They're just being led out of Egypt. The people did not have to step into the Red Sea to part that water. This waymark did not require much faith. It required some, not very much. All, all Moses did was raise his rod and part the waters. No one stepped into the water. They saw the dry ground and they walked on dry ground. By the time you get to this way, Mark, the people are no longer babies. They're meant to have grown and learnt. So by you, the time you get to here, the waters are not parted by the action of the leader. This required a step of faith on the part of the priesthood. And it's the part of the priesthood bearing the ark. Those carrying the ark on their shoulders step into the waters by faith and the waters divide and they pass through on dry ground. I want us to see the, the development of that test. They've prepared themselves for a battle by here. They cross the Jordan. They sing the song. They rejoice. I think that might have been back there. They rejoice. And then they go to work. Jericho, they begin their conquering. To reduce Jericho was seen by Joshua to be step one in the conquest of Canaan. 40, 40, 162.4. She's talking about our lack of faith. She said, The captain of the Lord's host did not reveal himself to the whole of the congregation. He communicated with Joshua, who related the story of this interview to the Hebrews. It rested with them to believe or to doubt the words of Joshua, to follow the commands given by him in the name of the captain of the Lord's host, or to rebel against his directions and deny his authority. 
The people could not see the host of angels, marshaled by the Son of God, who led their company. They might have reasoned, what unmeaning movements are these? And how ridiculous the performance of marching daily around the walls of the city, blowing trumpets of ram's horns meanwhile. This can have no effect upon the strong towering fortifications. But the very plan of continuing this ceremony through so long a time prior to the final overthrow of the walls afforded opportunity for the increase of faith among the Israelites. There is a requirement here that if they're to follow the direction of the Lord in this conquering, they have to be able to identify the voice of their leadership. It's here at Jericho that they begin the work of conquering. First Jericho, and then step two, Ai. Jericho Panium, step one, Ai Sunday Law, step two. And we identify this as a history of failure. I want to read from Joshua 7, 19 to 21. Joshua 7, 19 to 21. <coughs> and Joshua said unto Achan, so we understand that they attack Ai. It all goes wrong. And Joshua speaks to Achan. My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him. So they've had trouble in this history. They're trying to understand why. Tell me what thou hast done and hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Achan's response, he saw the garment of Babylon and he coveted it. Patriarchs and Prophets 496.2. Just the first sentence. The deadly sin that led to Achan's ruin had its root in covetousness. We're going to just briefly look at the line of the Millerites, but we understand that the history, the Alpha of ancient Israel, Alpha of ancient Israel, and the Alpha of modern Israel are both histories of failure. They both resulted in covetousness. And where did we line up covetousness with? Laodicea and what way, Mark? 1850. And what did we call 1850? Sunday law. So we're lining up Sunday law, Sunday law, covetousness, Laodicea, covetousness. We know at that level the reform lines are already matching up. I'm suggesting as we understand, as we have grown to understand the reform line of 144,000 more and more thoroughly, that we go back to the reform lines that began to open from 1989 and also <coughs> treat them the same way that we would treat our history. Understanding there is a difference between a history of failure and a history of success. If we can account for those few differences, we should treat them the same way. The people of Israel are led out of captivity. They cross the Red Sea. It's a test but they aren't required to have that much faith. They walk through on dry ground. Baptism and east wind and they go into the wilderness. There's a tarrying time here. In this wilderness time period, Moses strikes a rock and we see that due to that, there must be a change in leadership. The leadership changes, it transfers from Moses to that of Joshua and 
God repeats over and over again, as I was with Moses, so I will be with Joshua. Just after the death of Moses, they're required to cross the Jordan. That was a step of faith. We lined up 9-11 with 2019, how this period bookends, even with the dates, 9-11, 11-9. You can see it in various ways. They cross the Jordan. Just before the cross, they cross the Jordan, they've already prepared themselves for battle. They've already become fully trained and equipped, but they must go through this crossing of the Jordan, have the instructions from God, and then conquer Jericho. And it's here that they begin their work of taking over the glorious land. Jericho lining up with Panium, that's where we go to the Levites. Ai lining up with Sunday law, that's where we go to the Nethanims. We see in this history they fall into the same sin as the Millerites, that of covetousness. They've gone into a later seen condition because they're now surrounded by these earthly cities and they're becoming tempted, just as the Millerites were in their history. I want us to see the whole structure not even the details like baptism, east wind, wilderness. I want us to see the whole structure as it's laid out, that they're led out here to do a work that doesn't begin until here. So therefore, these details must exist between 9-11 and Panium. And as we fill them in, we're able to understand this history. The change of leadership between Moses and Joshua and the fact that that is necessitated by Moses' mistake. We'll move on from the line of Moses. I want us to look at the line of Christ. We're going to treat the line of Christ in the exact same fashion. So if it's the line of Christ, we want to see it on this scale, not on one of these. Identifying that these fit in here that you can identify two way marks in this history. So if this is the line of 144,000, we know that we also have these built in as well. So I want us to be able to see these in the line of Christ, that there are these three groups. But remember the scale that we're working at. Are we okay with that? Yes. Do you have anything to add? I'm going to throw this out. Moving on to the reform line of Christ. So this is the Alpha of ancient Israel, the history of Moses. This is the reform line of Christ, the Omega of ancient Israel. I want to identify this as a history of failure, remembering that the line of Christ is a history of success. They fulfill the job function that God has asked them to perform. Again, it begins with the birth. The birth and there's an increase of knowledge. Birth, 1989, increase of knowledge. And then we mark the baptism. And who is speaking in this history? John the Baptist. Birth, baptism. After Jesus is baptised, where does he go? 
Mark 1, verse 12 to 15. I'm not going to add all the details to this line that was added to this one. This one's just going to be more in brief. But I want us to see how the same structure connects. Mark 1, 12 to 15. This is after Jesus', Jesus baptism. It says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. So again, goes into the wilderness. Here there's a failure in the wilderness. Here there's success in the wilderness. Verse 13. How long were they in the wilderness for? 40 years, you have 40 days. I understand treating these reform lines is a lot like looking at the civil war. You have layers. You can create different parables. So I'm not suggesting there aren't different ways to use this history. I want us to see the original overall structure as it relates to three groups of people. I would suggest original intent. Verse 13, Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. So Jesus goes into the wilderness. Verse 14, now after that, John was put in prison Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So I'm suggesting we mark the wilderness to here. They go into the wilderness. You have the ministry of John the Baptist all the way till he's put in prison. I want us to consider this history now. Jesus goes into the wilderness. John is imprisoned. After John is put in prison, Jesus comes into Galilee and begins to say the time is fulfilled. So you have a change of messenger. The imprisonment of John and the working of Jesus. So this is the history of John the Baptist. Now we have the work of Jesus. First messenger, second messenger. I'm going to paraphrase from the desire of ages. Desire of Ages 178.2. I want us to see the conflict developing between two sides. Now John sees the tide of popularity turning away from himself to the Saviour. Day by day the crowds about him lessened. When Jesus came from Jerusalem to the, region about jo- to the region about Jordan, the people flocked to hear him. The number of his disciples increased daily. Many came for baptism. And while Christ himself did not baptise, he sanctioned the administration of the ordinance by his disciples. Thus he set his seal upon the mission of his forerunner. But the disciples of John looked with jealousy upon the growing popularity of Jesus. They stood ready to criticise his work and it was not long before they found occasion. A question arose between them and the Jews as to whether baptism availed to cleanse the soul from sin. They maintained that the baptism of Jesus differed essentially from that of John Soon they were in dispute with Christ's disciples in regard to the form of words proper to use at baptism and finally as to the right of Jesus to baptise at all. 
Jesus' disciples. So a conflict is developing between the disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus because you can see that more and more people are coming to Jesus. And this jealousy, this tension between the two groups of disciples, I'm not saying between John and Jesus, but between the two groups of disciples begins to grow and manifest itself. Desire of Ages 214.2. And paraphrasing through the the next couple of paragraphs. 214.2. The life of John had been one of active labour and the gloom and inaction of his prison life weighed heavily upon him. As week after week passed, bringing no change, despondency and doubt crept over him. His disciples did not forsake him. They were allowed access to the prison and they brought him tidings of the works of Jesus and told how the people were flocking to him. But they questioned why, if this new teacher was the Messiah, he did nothing to affect John's release. How could he permit his faithful herald to be deprived of liberty and perhaps life? So the disciples of John are attacking Jesus. Why? They're saying, you're not treating the first messenger well enough. They're saying, why don't you go and look after him? Why aren't you making his life easier? There's this attack and accusation being leveled against Jesus that he is not permitting his herald, the first messenger, to be comforted. These questions were not without effect. Effect on who? John. The questions of John the Baptist's disciples were not without effect on John. They had an impact. Doubts which otherwise would never have arisen were suggested to John. Satan rejoiced to hear the words of these disciples and to see how they bruised the soul of the Lord's messenger. So there's a division of jealousy between the disciples of one and the disciples of the other. It's the disciples of John... that feed him doubt. Regarding to why the second, herald, second messenger would allow the first to be left in such a condition. 205.1, sorry, 205.2. So we've continued from here. 215.2, sorry. 215.2. Like the Saviour's disciples, John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. So John the Baptist is imprisoned here and what is his problem? Still. He still doesn't understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David and as time passed and the Saviour made no claim to kingly authority, organizational leadership style. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David and as time passed and the Saviour made no claim to kingly authority, John became perplexed and troubled. He had declared to the people that in order for the way to be prepared before the Lord, the prophecy of Isaiah must be fulfilled. It goes through the mountains and the hills be brought low, the crooked made straight. Sorry? Yes. Really the 214.2 through to the history, 215.2, the same. So the conflict between the disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus. The disciples of John are the ones feeding him doubt, causing him to doubt the authority of Jesus. And part of what is causing confusion in John's mind is that even at this point, he still does not understand the nature of the kingdom. 
And the fact that Jesus is not asserting kingly authority causes him to doubt the second messenger. We understand then the death of John. I talked about the history of the cross and how we line up those way marks. Again, I just want to work backwards. We understand that at a point in time they go to the Gentiles. A people are raised up. In this history, John the Baptist raised up and others joining him to do a work, to bring the gospel to the world. It's not till this history, Jericho AI, Pentecost Gentiles, that they're actually doing that work. It's here that they, first one group, first the disciples, then the disciples are fully trained, fully prepared. They go into Jerusalem, back to the Jewish people. And then the third group, the Gentiles. I don't want to detail that history too much. It's not the point of the study. What I want us to see is the cross. The cross is the primary test for the first group of people. It is 2019. So if we're going to do the reform line of Christ in its, I would suggest its main application, which is identifying three groups of people and a successive work, the cross primary application is 2019. So you know this is a history of success. It is of any reform line, Moses, Christ, Millerites, 144,000. None represent our history so closely as the history of Christ. The only other history of success at that level. So when we say that this is the number one reform line to explain our own and the cross is the number one way mark to bring to 2019, you know that the current history we're in is not going to be easy. Neither will this test. And John is not understanding the nature of the kingdom. 2019, the cross. I just want us to see what some people begin to do at the death of John. Here. Many who had been convicted by the preaching of John the Baptist, so these who have come... These have joined the movement through the preaching of John. Many who've been convicted by the preaching of John and then accepted Christ began to doubt as to John's mission when he was imprisoned and put to death. And they now doubted that Jesus was the Messiah for whom they looked so long. So they, they come in under John and then when they see this history, they begin to doubt. And after the death of John, who they're holding accountable and doubting is the second. 2019, the cross. I want us to consider the history just before the cross. Where are they? They're in the upper room. It's just before the cross, November 9, 2019, and they're in the upper room. And what does Jesus do to the disciples? What is that? Wash their feet. Washing the, the feet is an exhibition of what leadership is meant to look like. I want to read from Review and Herald, June 14. This is Review and Herald, 
June 14. 1898, paragraph 8. Review on Herald, June 14, 1898, paragraph 8. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. For I have given you an example of the position you should hold toward one another. If I then, your boss, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should lead as I have led you. Here is the object lesson. Ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. What Jesus is doing is getting down on his knees and demonstrating for those underneath him, what leadership by a boss looks like. Jesus is demonstrating true organisation, the organisation that is necessary if they're going to do any work in this history. CC 319.2. CC 319.2. When the Saviour's hands were bathing those soiled feet and wiping them with the towel, the heart of Judas thrilled through and through with the impulse then and there to confess his sin, but he would not humble himself. He hardened his heart against repentance and the old impulses for the moment put aside again controlled him. Judas was offended at Christ's act in washing the feet of his disciples. If Jesus could so humble himself, he thought, he could not be Israel's king. All hope of worldly honour in a temporal kingdom was destroyed. Judas was satisfied that there was nothing to be gained by following Christ. So right before the cross, Jesus gets down on his knees and demonstrates what he wants organisation to look like going forward. He washes the feet of the disciples. One in particular resists because one in particular is looking for the same type of kingdom that John believed in. They still believed that that is the organisational structure of a kingly power that is about to be represented in this history. Because that he has not let go of John's understanding, he sees Jesus represent what organisation looks like and he can't take it. He becomes offended at Christ's act in washing the feet of his disciples, in demonstrating organisational structure. And if he recognises that if that is the humble position that Jesus is about to take, his position is about to be just as humble, if not more so. Judas wanted an authoritarian style of leadership. The second messenger washes the feet of Judas. Judas believed in the same style of of same future kingdom that John the Baptist had taught them to believe in. Jesus demonstrated what service and leadership will look like in the kingdom he is here setting up. Judas leaves, the demonstration of true leadership is too much. Judas rejects the style of leadership that, Judas, that Jesus exhibits. When he's confronted with true organisation, he gets up and he leaves the table. This is a pamphlet, I believe it's in the Review and Herald. I'm just going to paraphrase it, I can give the reference later. Just one paraphrase, this is from Ellen White. He was talking of Jesus, he was berated, opposed, despised, not appreciated, but the point, one of the disciples even rejected him. Judas went with him right up to the very last hour. So if the cross is 2019, we know that this upper room experience is in the last hour. The very last hour, right at the end. I want to make one other point. What was Judas's result? 
Judas's role in their ministry. Judas kept the purse. If people wanted to give money to their movement, who did they give it to? Judas. If they needed money, who did they ask for? They wrote, filled out a form, gave it to Judas and said, we need this much for a school. Judas was the keeper of the purse. Jesus never questioned it. He never tried to remove it from Judas. For Judas' sake, that organisational structure was allowed to continue. Very briefly, the reform line of the Millerites. Already laid out, this is 1850. Going back to this way, Mark, 1798, an increase of knowledge. You could say 1840 or April 19, 1844. As we do this alpha history, it's the Millerites, the alpha history of modern Israel, we're again dealing with the history of failure. So you can see covetousness, covetousness, the later seen condition, the failure to fulfill their job function. We see an increase of knowledge a leading out. We see this structure. 2014, July 21, Boston, from 1798 to, to July 21, it's under William Miller, from July 21, recognising it's a history of failure, but there's a new leadership, Snow. We're marking that transition at Boston, where Samuel Snow begins the Midnight Cry message. If this is Boston, we would line up 2019, October 22. In its main application, you know it can't be Daniel 12.1 here because 1850, they have a new chart. They're going to another group of people. The only problem now is they're in a later seen condition. These are the reform lines that begin to open up in 1989. I don't mean after 1989, I mean in the year itself. 1989, they begin to open up. Do you think they have anything to teach us in 2019? My question is, where did we go wrong? If we want to start breaking down the role of the second leader and say that Moses takes them over Jordan, how do you reconstruct that? What you'll find is if you want to define this in any other way, you're going to have to break down every reform line all the way to here. Because this is the last thing you can have any faith in. If this is wrong, tell us where. And if it's not wrong, then you know that from this point forward, it's Joshua, it's Christ, it's Samuel Snow. And as he was with Moses... So he will be with Joshua. The problem is there's tension in this history because of the disciples of one. There's tension because of the rejection, the first leader rejecting. There's the issue of the mistake and there's the disciples, the associates. It's the associates that go to John the Baptist and say, can't you see he's not a kingly power? He's not... He's not giving you the respect you deserve. He's letting you stay in prison. Where's the respect in that? And they're poisoning the mind of John as to the work of Jesus. The most serious application that's impossible to ignore is the upper room experience. The demonstration of what organisation looks like. The fact that Judas could not accept 
a new structure being put in place, not based on this power struggle and identifying Jesus permitted, never fought it, allowed Judas to be the keeper of the purse. If we don't define this in our reform line as 9-11, 2014, what we're going to have to do is go back to our original understanding that we laid out before of this repeating pattern. We would have to go 1989, 9-11, 2014, 2019, Panium. Then you're going to have to start just how, to see just how much of our message you want to deconstruct to where you feel comfortable if you don't accept the role of the second messenger. And what you'll find is you have to deconstruct it to this point. That this movement has not been right in 18 years. That you cannot make application of Joshua, of Jesus, of Samuel Snow. I hope that in the coming days, whatever you see presented, bring it back to the reform lines opened up at the time of the end. They should make any other argument clear. Do you have anything you want? I'm hoping that we use our reform lines, these reform lines opened up at the time of the end as our template to understand going forward. So whatever happens, whatever our close of probation, our test looks like, that the reform lines from the time of the end will guide us because they tell us where we are in history. If we want to say that they don't, that we're not here, then we have to reject the midnight cry message. If we reject the midnight cry message, we have to reject the second messenger. If we reject the second messenger, we, our only safe place is go back 18 years to 9-11. And I think you'll find the people that have left this movement have all done that. It's the first step. Do you have anything you want to say? Do we have any questions, Brother Manchin? After Snow, he deliberately left that blank. Um, from 1844, October 22nd to 1850, he deliberately left that blank for the next session. No, I, I, I find you could fill in this history as well, but I was suggesting it was irrelevant to the study. Okay. Brother Vadim. You could see that. Any thoughts or questions? You can mark a type of death at that way mark on so many levels. 2019 is placed because of the revolutions. All the revolutions are showing the death of Donald Trump. You know he doesn't literally die at that way mark. But that way mark is, is a, a death. You have Jesus' death, Trump death on, on many levels. It's characterized by a death. I'm not sure. Maybe in a different application, I think, if you're going to make it the structure.
I don't understand the question. We're making an application. We're not saying there's a literal purse. Literal purse, spiritual bank account. Do you want to answer it? The question asked is why we're making an application of the purse here and not in the history of Moses. Because we're saying that Judas kept the purse and we're making that an issue in our history subject. I think you've got questions on two levels. The first level is, can we take one line with one concept, one idea, and bring it to the end of the world whilst having another concept or another idea at that same way mark? The answer is, of course we can, because that's line upon line. We do not have to see money in each reform line. You already know that principle. The second point you bring up is the methodology of parables. If you have something literal, why is it literal at the end of the world? <coughs> you know that when we talk about a disappointment in the Millerite line, we talk about a disappointment in our line. So that's not the only thing that we um, bring to view in that literal way, if you want to speak about that. A tarrying time, a hiding, all of those concepts are brought into our line, if you want to express it in that literal to literal fashion. But it's not as literal as you make it to appear. It's a spiritual application of a literal story. In a literal story, Judas is nominated to be that treasurer. There are not one-to-one -one, uh, parallels. The point that's being made is that in the story of Christ, there's an issue about money. The tension that's occurring there is about money. What wasn't brought to view there was Judas's desire to separate or to control the movement through money when he negotiates 30 pieces of silver with the priesthood and the number 30 happens at this history when this movement turns 30 in 2019. So it's not just the issue of him being a treasurer and making that parallel. It's not as literal 
for literal as you make it to appear, there are other symbols that are tied into this. I think uh, when we do this line, we have to look at uh, the relationships between characters, and that's what it repeats actually. I mean, the, if you talk from the perspective. So, what our brother's saying is that it's not just the issue of there's a treasurer and he's holding the accounts for the movement, it's not that simplistic. The point that he's beginning to make is it's about relationships. It's the relationship of Judas with. Uh, Jesus and how that interplay works connected to the concept of money. Yeah. I'm just doing that for the mic. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I was just saying, like, if you look from the perspective of uh, the resources of the work, Judas was to the disciples like FFA, who is this work. It's just like they had the same relationship. They were the ones who were keeping the resources and providing the resources. Uh, just like you mentioned, the fact that... Oh, this way. Yeah. So, the relationship between Judas and the disciples, or the movement, is Brother Philip's parallel in that with the relationship of FFA with the disciples or the movement today. It's about the relationship, and that relationship in this line of thought is connected through a story of financing. Not just, it's not even just a story of money. The story of financing, but it's about that interplay. Can I make a point there? In connection with not dropping everything into our reform line, we've spoken this week about Abraham Lincoln, how you can see him in different ways. We're not dropping this in and saying that there has been financial indiscretion or stealing the way Judas exhibited. That, I think, would be to drop in an application unwarranted. I would agree with, with our, brother, our brother's point about it being about this relationship between um, the financing, the movement, the people, uh, and Judas. Did everyone who had their hand up, is it just two, two people? Three. Three, four. So we'll go from Tamina, we'll go this way. Don't, no more hands at the moment. I think we need to be careful with the history of failure. Once you get to those way marks, and it starts to disintegrate. So don't we have to be careful about Moses and Joshua too? This part is solid. And this is our primary reference not to take the leaders from a history of failure, because you know in this history, in, it, in a history of failure, it's going to be in this part that it all goes wrong. You can see mistakes beforehand. Um, for example, failure, success. Failure in the wilderness by the Israelites, success in the wilderness by Jesus. So you can see changes, but it's over here that they go wrong. Here, here they fulfill their job function. They're under the same, they're under Jesus this whole time. What he's done is restructure it. Now you have this properly organised movement going forward where they're appointing elders and it's forming a proper organised structure so they can go back to the church and to the world. So are we marking now in Christ like Jesus or the disciples as the leaders? Jesus is still the leader. He's still taken over that, but you have this organisational structure. We have to be careful with a parable that this isn't literally Jesus in that history. So you have the symbol of Jesus plus then the 12 disciples who are the movement, like you have the leader of the movement and then the movement. Who are the 12 disciples here? That's what I was asking. 
It depends. Depends on your story. If you're going to put the 12 disciples here and they run away at the cross, they're lost. You can't run away at the cross. If you want to be faithful here, you have to be the priest stepping into Jordan, not the multitude watching. You need to be on the cross. You need to be... So it depends on your application. But when we go first leadership, second leadership, I wouldn't use a history of failure. This history as our reference point. Unless we're drawing a different lesson. Just add, the the storyline that was put there was for Judas. We could, you could do another storyline for the 11 disciples who failed at that way mark as well. So that would be a different story of why they fail. They run away. So there are people who are going to leave the movement at that way mark there at 2019 but that would be a different line of thought. Who, who was that? Arian. It was a response on what Sister Emmanuel has said, so I'm not sure if it's still relevant, but she mentioned about the Jordan, that it's not baptism, that it does not symbolize baptism, or that there's not, bat- there's not a baptism to refer to. Um, and I want to mention that it actually represents baptism, not as 9-11 or not as the Red Sea, but it, it lines up with the cross. And the cross is, I would say, the primary example of baptism because there is a death and a resurrection taking place and that's the whole thing of baptism. So there is a, the Jordan represents the dying and the resurrection entering into the new uh, the kingdom, um, just like the cross is. And based on the 30 years, we would mark baptism at 2019 in one application as well. Just another comment to to that person. I think we are safer perhaps to compare Omega with Omega and Alpha with Alpha. So if the issue of money rises up in the Omega history, it also rose up in the history of Christ. So I I think that, that can... I see we are uh, and I'm forty four represent more likely the line of Christ than the other line, correct? I would agree with that sentiment. The sentiment being that the line of Christ is a history of success, therefore a a more honest representation. Um, clearer representation. Just a, a comment you mentioned about the Omega, not in the context of the way you said it. All of these models are built upon, a, upon the methodology of parable teaching. Another way to expect, ex, express parable teaching is Alpha and Omega. We haven't, I don't think there was a particular study that was done at this camp meeting to, to explain and to show that clearly, except through the concept of dispensations. The Alpha is one dispensation, the Omega is another. You could go for the natural to the spiritual. So we know that this idea of Alpha and Omega is also connected to what Adventists call, based upon the Alan White studies, the Omega. Um, People call it the Omega apostasy and the Alpha apostasy. So when we start using parable teaching, We should be on guard because if studies are put out that begin to challenge this model, you should expect it to be based upon parable teaching. It's not going to be based upon some brand new, strange methodology that you've never heard of. It will be based upon uh, the same methodology that's being used here, but it will be a corrupted form of that methodology. The most obvious one If we're talking about apostasy in this day and age, people will gravitate to the story of the Alpha apostasy and the Omega apostasy. But you can see that these lines are not based upon that modelling. They're based upon reform lines, the classic reform lines that this movement has understood from the very beginning. It's not based upon an Alpha apostasy and Omega apostasy. So if you see a line that's based upon that modelling, 
you know it's not using this methodology even though it's under the cloak of this methodology because Alpha and Omega is parable teaching. These lines begin at the time of the end and the time of the end is when the reformer is raised up. If you want to do Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, it's based upon not apostasy, but the leading by God in this movement. And so you have to be careful as you approach these studies because people will use the same methodology that we use, but if it's framed in a wrong way, it's really easy to, let, to lead people astray. So I want us to be clear on that. This is not some Alpha and Omega apostasy, because that is compare and contrast, repeat and enlarge, parable teaching. But it's not based upon apostasy. This is based upon God leading the movement and bringing it through this story. And this is a consistent pattern of reform lines. And if, you, if this message begins to be challenged, which it may well be challenged, you can be sure it will be challenged using this methodology of parable teaching. And secondly, people will gravitate to the model of the Omega apostasy because that's the only tool that they will have to fight this message. And if you're going to use Omega apostasy, you need to know that it must begin with an Alpha apostasy, otherwise it's not Alpha and Omega. And these lines, both in these studies that you've seen and the one that, you sh that, I sh that we had this morning, if we're going to argue that we're in apostasy today, that means the movement was in apostasy from the very beginning, which is the whole story about why 2012 could not be half right and half wrong, because that takes you all the way back, and we've been wrong all the way through this movement. Therefore, we didn't have a movement, and everybody in this movement, everybody has taught that this movement is without mistakes, because it's the line of success. And we explained in our camp meeting this week what that success looks like when people are stumbling and falling along the way because it's the vulnerability that God uses when he's dealing with human beings. So I just want to make sure that we're all aware if studies begin to come up that war against the truth, it will be using parable teaching and the one that we gravitate to all the time is the model of Alpha and Omega apostasy because this is what most people are identified as who leave the movement. Whether it was Path of the Just, um, Tree of Life, they were all labelled as the Omega Apostasy. And if this movement is labelled as the Omega Apostasy, you need to find out what the Alpha Apostasy was, because we're saying that this movement is based upon a line of success, and the Alpha, the time of the end, was not the beginning of apostasy, it was the beginning of success. It begins and ends with success. You would have to call the line of Christ as an apostasy also. Yes, that's the very point. But you can develop a line that looks very close, using all, uses the logic of, of parable teaching, but comes to a completely different result. But, this study seems to, to it's more like a personal discussion. That there is no hope. Do you think there is any hope? I think the question of hope is one that you would have to answer for yourself. And so does each one of us. That we can pray that people that we, we have hope for people. Someone asked earlier, should we be reaching out to our brothers and sisters? And we, we believe that we should. Everyone here should be contacting <coughs> FFA and pleading with them to at least talk with us. We've explained clearly that we want to talk with them, that we want to reconcile, and the refusal to talk is on their part, not ours. So we should reach out to them. So whether or not it's hopeless, only God can decide that. But, you, but the lines say what they say. Yes, that's why we would ask that everyone in this room 
We all know these people personally. Contact them and plead with them. We, we would urge you to do that. Being aware that it's not just an effort to save them. <coughs> there's hundreds in this movement at stake. And as much as there's an effort to reach out to our brothers and sisters, our duty is also to, to a large flock who doesn't understand what's happening, who could find themselves in the midst of something they didn't expect with no direction. Our duty is also particularly to them. It's twofold. Brother Philip. I just want to make a short comment about uh, uh, Jesus dying at the cross and Samuel Snow leaving the work on October 22nd. I heard that people have questioned that. And I think we, this shouldn't trouble us um, because what happened when we see Jesus there, Jesus from uh, John to, to, to the end and you know, so, snow again to the end is, is that what they're doing is, is not necessarily their physical presence, is that the, the legacy and the principles that they help embed in the movement. Like Jesus helps establish an organization that goes beyond his death, you know, beyond his crucifixion. Uh, so as, so uh, Samuel Snow helps establish a truth, the midnight cry line that goes beyond October 22nd, even though he's not there physically. So even though they leave, uh, uh, Snow leaves, or Jesus dies, uh, their, their legacy, their principles, they still continue. To, to shine. Oh, it's God's words to Joshua here. Even though Joshua is the leader here, it's at this point that God says he's, he's going to lift them up. So he's going to, don't want to make it people, but the movement, it's positive. This, I, I think that, that this way mark of the cross is deceptive because it just looks so dark and so hopeless. But Ellen White frames it in the language of complete and total victory, which is why I said earlier this week, the current state we're in, the current message, it's dividing two groups of people. One group see what this movement is becoming, and they see restoration, and they are just filled with joy. And another group sees just the destruction of their hopes. It depends how you want to define the cross. It's painful, it's not easy, but if we get through this history that there's a great promise, this is actually victory. Even for Christ, it's his victory. Tamina, did you have uh, There was something that I was, was going to pull up about your comments with apostasy uh, when you called your mom and then uh, Omega apostasy. Is that not the case that we call them with Omega apostasy? Obviously, we're going to be in the same situation again where you have two groups calling what's like the Omega apostasy. But is that not valid? Like, for example, if you see Ellen A leading now, representing Judas, would that not be the Omega apostasy? The, the models that we're using are not just random statements from the spirit of prophecy taken out of their context and just used in this ad hoc fashion because that's how the movement has operated in the past. That's why we're not using that model of alpha and omega of apostasy. We're using well-defined rules that have been around for 30 years based upon the principle that the first reformer, Elder Jeff, came up with the increase of knowledge, the formalization of the message. This is a methodology that has integrity, not just taking a random passage out of its context because we don't know what the context is. People don't even ask who, she, who and what she's talking of in any serious fashion and make a proper application of that to understand how we would even apply that, at what level we would apply that. It's just really bad methodology we've approached in the past and that's why it would be all too easy to say, we're in this fight and one of us is the Omega 
we're not doing that. We've, give, we've got three <coughs> reform lines here. We went through a previous study before about what organisation looks like, what the issues are. Th these models have integrity to them. They, they, it's clear to see multiple histories showing you the same thing. They're based upon a whole history, not just on an isolated statement. So whether or not we were right to call them the Omega or not, I cannot answer to that. But I don't anticipate us saying that if we get into a struggle that we'll identify that group as the Omega apostasy because we're going to stick to the methodology that, the methodology that you see here with continual refinement as in how the Lord shows us. I was saying the only thing people have ever had to fight against a voice is this statement about the Omega and it's based upon the Alpha and then you have to see how these lines are working and our understanding is that they're not even based upon line upon line methodology in the way we understand it today in the midnight cry. It's based upon a broken model. We've done hours and hours of study the last two days. And you haven't heard it come, come up once from us, so you can see that we're refraining from it. There's no need to use that because I don't think it's helpful it's, it's kind of like scare tactics, scare fear-mongering. It's just called someone a mega apostasy without even properly being able to identify it. You can see the way these lines have been laid out with dates. It, it's, it's easy to see how those histories are coming into play in a really specific way in our history. If we were to do a study on the Omega, it would use this kind of methodology in a clear and precise way how you go from one dispensation to another. I've, n I've never called those previous groups the Omega Apostasy because I've never seen it placed on a proper reform line with context. So we know that they've left the movement, but I'm not sure about the methodology, how, how we use these terms. So I agree with those sentiments. There was a hand. Emma, Sister Emma. Um, I just want to be clear what application you're making on these lines and what's the primary the primary purpose is to show the transition between the first and second messenger. And you're making an application from the middle of the line. Um, with Moses, John, and the other last one's no maybe. I just wanted to clarify what Moses, the death of Moses and the death of John, are you making any application with that? I'm not being specific with the death. It's primarily, one of the main points is to see the second. Because if we think that Moses leads us over Jordan, it means that we must still be in the history of Moses, which means that we're back in this history. And if we're back in this history, we're pre-2014, means this, but the priests have not yet experienced a Sunday law. This is, that's just one of the ways where you see that unless you can identify a second leadership, the last safe point for you is 9-11. If we're still in the history where the first is the voice to follow, not only is 2019 entirely incorrect, this whole week is incorrect, October was incorrect, 2014 was incorrect, 2012 is incorrect, and you're back here. I want us to see the implications of if we try and break parts off these reform lines. Brother James. Just one quick question. I don't really want to take away from the study, but just on the pattern. Wouldn't, unless I missed it, wouldn't the line with Jesus stop at 2019? Isn't that up there? Life Why? Life. I just want to make a, a one point about the different ways we can we can see different parables all through this. There's right. so many layers. But I, I drew up before a couple of lines that were the external and the internal. And on one I said Trump and on the second I said Parminder. And we compared and contrasted. 
This is the raising up of the leadership of one external movement that takes you all the way through. This is the raising up of leadership of the internal movement that takes, that takes you all the way through. We come to 2019 with Donald Trump and we see that this is 11-9-2019 and it's characterised by the death. So you have, at this point you could say, Abraham Lincoln dies, um, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, you could lay out all of these, but then you can also see Napoleon. So with Donald Trump, we've said since October that this way mark of November 9 is his death and resurrection. Death of a dictator, rising up of a dictator, but it's the same person. So if we're going to compare and contrast the internal down here, does everyone see that? I'll draw it better. November 9, 2019, Donald Trump. It's death, it's death and resurrection. Uh, Lincoln, death. Kaiser Wilhelm, death. But then life, Napoleon, for example. And we put others over that history. Compare and contrast, that's the external. We come to the internal. <coughs> And instead, we've lined up the internal leadership. If we were to come to 2019, it's also a death and resurrection. In this case, you could say Jesus dies and is resurrected, uh, or Samuel Snow. So, so you can see the ca internal characteristics here of a death and resurrection. But we're already saying that about the external with Trump. He dies and resurrects here. But it's Trump all through this history and it's the same leadership all through this history before and after November 9. Right. I know you can make, I know you can make several different applications, but with this application, that line particularly is showing who is leading the movement physically, right? So the top one is Joshua and it goes all the way through. The next one is Jesus and it would stop at his crucifixion as a physical leader. Snow as a If Trump goes all the way through, ours goes all the way through. Right. Different people symbolising different aspects of his work. That there's a change happening here. So it's not the purpose of this study to describe the changes occurring here. But you can see that it's the same person. Trump, November 9, Trump Panium, Trump Sunday. So with That it goes all the way through. He can't use this line to, to show your role in this history to go from first, second, and third. We're only using this for first and second. There's no way you can put you in there. I'm going to say yes, but I don't like talking about myself. There's only two here, but who's the second here? Who gives the message? And that's 2018, who gave the message? I'm saying that the second is two people. Sorry, Emma? Uh, Avoid the questions. So, yeah, to, to just clarify what you said. First messenger, second messenger. This is 2014, this is 2019. And here is 2016 and 2018. 2018 is Boston. Sorry, Exeter. Who gives the message at Exeter? The second leader who gave the message in 2018, the second leader. So it depends on your line what you want to make the second. <coughs> For Philip. If 
Brother Abba, save us. I'm going to the issue of Jesus not continuing after the cross. Before he leaves, he said that he will remain until the end of time, he said. So even he is not in person, the promise is that he stood there for the cross. See that it's Jesus who is guiding after the cross. He does literally. He guides them through that history. Just in, in a previous study, we've spoken about the first, second and third angels' messages. And we've identified that the first and the third are the two messages, the two messengers. So when you come to this study, you have the first and the second. The point that Tess was making was that in 2018, who gives the midnight cry message? It's the second messenger, Snow. But people want to identify Snow as one person, which you can do sometimes, because it's a second angel, second person, but it, it can also be identified as another person, a third person, a third messenger. Depends on the point that you want to make. So when people say there's only one person in that story, you have two different layers. It can be the second or the third person. That's the point that she was making. Is it clear enough? You sound very happy. Uh, Brother Richard? I just want to say a, a comment. Um, we said for a long time that the lines are the binding. That this is what will guide us home. This is what we put our faith in, put our lives on the line, literally for these lines. And we've used another word that that has guided us lately, and that's being consistent. And we see all this knowledge, all this training we've had the past year, especially of thinking differently and being consistent. And then we go back to these lines, and we can see everything that we've been taught is helping us look back at these lines in a new way, in a refined way, and it's consistent. And I, I see the beauty in this because it's not condemning anyone. It's almost like a conditional prophecy. Nobody at SFA has to fall victim to what these lines say. It's your choice. You see it on the line. The line is telling you that you need to make a decision. You need to get on board. And it's the same with, with everything, with gender, with race, conspiracy theories. The line's always telling us how to get our lives in order if we get on board with the movement. So anyone who's watching this video, I don't think because we made a line of uh, showing issues with Judas at the end, that we take that and we let that be all that you said today. Because you've also pointed out Moses. You've also, you've, you've also pointed out John. So the lines are just giving us the opportunity to see where we are. And, and to make a proper decision. And that's what they've always been designed to do. Nobody had to fall victim and be that person that fulfills it. You know, let it be somebody else. It doesn't have to be you. So I, I see this as a beautiful representation of how we can, those who are being challenged by the lines can get their lives on board. I agree. It's not a coincidence that we're using the same lines from 1989. We're not bringing some new, even if it's accurate, even if it's an accurate Bible line, we're not bringing a new one. These are our lines from 1989 that are defining where we are. I already explained what you would need to do if you wanted to do that. You'd have to go back to the original, understand what it was, because the Alpha Apostasy happens in two steps. It happens in the 1850s and the early 1900s. You have to take both of those histories, which are two Alphas, then you have to bring them to the end, because in fact, the one that's in the early 1900s, where you have the Omega issue with Conradi, 
that actually is the omega apostasy. She calls it the alpha because she says we've seen this before. So you have, you have to understand the relationship between those two, then you go to the 1900s and bring all of those histories into ours. It's a lot more complex than just saying this is the, alpha, this is the omega apostasy because you're bad people. It's not sound methodology. That's the only point that I wanted to bring up, is to say, well, what is it? And then if you wanted to know, you have to spend some time studying it, lay it out on the line correctly, understand clearly what the alpha was in two steps, see that you have an alpha to omega from the 15, 1850s to the 1900s, and then take the 1900s into our history. It's not that straightforward to do. It's more complex than just saying there was apostasy, apostasy at the beginning, there'll be apostasy at the end, and just label people who disagree with you as being the Omega apostasy. It's not sound methodology. That's the only point I wanted to bring up. But it's cloaked under the guise of parable teaching because it's Alpha and Omega. And it sounds subtly simple. I just want to raise a point. Part of the problem that we're facing today is something that we've spoken about for a long time in our movement, but which we have studiously avoided. This is the raising up of the ensign or the living testimony. And the reason why we've avoided that is because in our early history, we would ask the church not to look at a human being. We did not want to address the issue of righteousness by faith. It's not that we considered ourselves to be bad people, but it was a distraction. And so we focused on the concept of people looking at our methodology to understand what was right and wrong. Essentially, Daniel 11, 40 to 45. That's where we wanted to put people's attention. And knowing the fact that the Sunday law God's people would be raised up as an ensign and the Gentiles would flow into the church. That's, that's a standard um, model that we've used for, for decades now. Because we're in the history of the Sunday law, people have not gone back into that history or back into those studies and acknowledged the fact that if you're going to raise up the ensign in that history, then that should be happening now. And as soon as you do that, you, stand, you then begin to merge the message and the messenger. We brought that up at this camp meeting that Elder Jeff initiates this cascade of questions that if he identifies himself as the messenger of the first message, then the question is who would be the next ones? And for many years he would studiously avoid identifying it as an individual then in 17, he took the step to do that. And when people would ask him the question, what about the second and the third, or who Elijah is, he began to change his position, or at least soften it, to at least acknowledge that the possibility that it would be an individual. So I just want us to um, keep that point in mind. Part of the reason why we would say, don't look at the person, look at the lines, is the following. Because what we would say would be, you have to use your sanctified logic or your God-given um, reason ability, reasoning ability to investigate what we're saying to make sure for yourself that it's correct. <coughs> everyone knows that that's the line that he used and everyone else who followed him <coughs> used. Don't look at me, look at the message. If I'm doing something bad, it doesn't matter. If what I'm teaching is correct, it should hold. So I want, us to rem I want to remind us of that. And the reason why that's important is because you need to be doing this now. If you feel or there's a sense that maybe there's an agenda behind all of this, because when, as soon as you come up with the issue of money, people talk about people having agendas or power, 
which is essentially fame and fortune. When you deal with fame and fortune, we use the word gadal. You know people have got an agenda. So if you're concerned that we have an agenda, which we may or may not have, it's your responsibility to work out whether or not we have a positive agenda or a negative one, because we certainly do have an agenda. That goes without saying. It's your responsibility to work out if our agenda is a true and honest one or a false one. And the only way you can assess it is by looking at the lines. So we want to go back to that argument, even though we're in the history, that the ensign is being lifted up and we're identifying messages with messengers, you still need to be sure to do your diligence duty to make sure these lines are correct. Because if we are leading you astray, and we may, we, we may well be doing that, I think as he would say, shame on you for not studying properly. You need to work out if the lines are correct, and if they are, you don't need to worry if we have an agenda or not, because you cannot be led astray. It all comes down to methodology, not to looking at the person if you like them, if they're nice to you, if they treat you properly. Having said that, I don't want to shy away from the model that was presented here. It's not about whether or not we are nice people and we would wash your feet. It's about the style of leadership. Because that now becomes a component of, prophetic, of our prophetic story to help you identify who has the agenda and who does not have who has the good ad agenda and who has the bad agenda. Because those who have the good agenda will follow the right leadership style. It becomes a component of our story. And this is the dilemma that people are now going to face. Because they're going to ask, who are the nice people and who are the unnice ones? Who are the ones who are autocratic and who are the ones that negotiate deals? So when we start thinking about secret agendas or people's motivation behind doing things, your only safety is to check these lines. Checking these lines is not as straightforward as you think, not because they're complex, it's because built into that line is the, not the character of an individual leader per se, but a style of leadership that is now being brought to view as a prophetic testing message. And if you see leaders who are exerting authority in an inappropriate way, you know that they have an agenda which is bad. And if you see leaders who are exerting authority as a servant, you know that they also have an agenda on the positive side. It'd be foolish to, to suggest that Jesus didn't have an agenda, that Moses didn't have an agenda. That's the whole point of these lines because it leads to a conclusion, and the conclusion is the conclusion of an agenda. So, everyone needs to be on guard. Be on guard about who and what we claim to be. Be on guard on who and what anybody claims to be. Your only safety is line upon line, it's methodology. And all you need to do is follow the rules from the very beginning upon the testimony of two or three things established. Follow William Miller's rules. The first and the fifth rule will guide you and navigate you through this, uh, this treacherous, difficult time period between 14 and 19, as labelled in those histories. And you'll be safe. And you don't have to worry if we've got some evil agenda, because the lines will keep you on the straight and narrow. All of these concepts, ideas are fear-mongering, which is why we refuse to enter into that realm in our studies is to show you what's happening so you can see is this what's happening in real time before you arise. It's not to make you feel scared that FFA, the FFA have an agenda which is evil or bad. So we're not suggesting that in the slightest. We don't believe they have a bad agenda, but we do believe prophecy is being fulfilled. If there are no more questions. Um, many of us are leaving early. If there's no more questions, we can close. It's um, been a long day. It's been a long, 
an interesting camp. I hope that you, if we could just separate what's these, these two days of conference and just look at the camp meeting, um, we could, if we could do that and put that on its own, I'm sure all of us could testify that this was a beautiful camp meeting. Everybody enjoyed themselves. We had great light. There was a unity that perhaps many people have never experienced before. The communion, the baptisms, those who were here can testify that the Lord was really here. The Holy Spirit was walking amongst us. Those things have been overshadowed by the last two days of our conference. But as has been late, um, spoken here, the cross is a... Um, a difficult time period for each of us to uh, to navigate through. What we've said is that we want to wait for um, Elder Tabo to speak with Elder Jeff, to see what happens then, the outcome of that, and. Um, we actually have a, and just we'll see what happens. At the meantime, we're, we're asking not to talk too much. We've given some guideline of how to respond to people if they ask questions, but just watch and pray. Beyond that, I'm not sure that we can do anything. I can't hear that? We're not putting anything on social media. No. If we can please avoid that. Um, avoid what? Avoid putting things on social media. <coughs> avoid opening up this wound um, because it's already beginning to open up. The purpose of these studies, um, the videos won't be uploaded. They may never be uploaded depending on what the outcome is. Um, but we certainly don't want to be premature in our conduct. We feel as talking to leaders, to talk openly and honestly to you, um, but for you to respect that, the respect that we've afforded you, not to share these truths, to precipitate um, <coughs> a split that may be irrecoverable in the movement until we, we, we see where these things go. We've got... Um, <coughs> seven brethren here who are about to return, I think, all tomorrow. Um, and they have to go and face these issues. They, they live, they're literally neighbours to the ministry and to see how they have to engage with these problems. We don't want to make their life harder than it is already. So just give us a few days um, about how we proceed. Uh, I just want to... Did you want to say anything, uh, Tabo, about... No. Will there be an official communique? Like I don't know what we'll do it, um, moving forward, but I, I don't know what we'll do moving forward. We, we have all your contact details. Uh, we're on the group chat, so that would be the easiest way for us to move forward. Um, <coughs> that as and when we need to communicate something. So should we keep the group chat for now? Keep the group chat for now. There's no more questions. We'll, um, we, we need to. I want to finish because our our, our uh, tapes about to. It might be good just to keep the group chat for organisational questions, issues, uh, and updates rather than just delete it afterwards. Because actually, all the leaders in here uh, want to just leave it intact and use it wisely and appropriately. That's for only um, organisational issues. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this camp meeting. We know for many people it's been a time period of restoration. We've seen more of your character, more of what you're like, through not just what you're doing now, but what you've done in past dispensations to bring us to this point of restoration. I pray, Lord, as we look at these lines that have been presented um, in the last, last week, 
that we will have faith in you, such a deep faith, Lord, that we can step into the Jordan trusting that you'll open the way before us, however unlikely that it looks. May we trust you based on your based on the prophecy that you have opened before us. I pray that we'll see our place on these lines. Lord, we know many people, Father, they're, they're afraid and they, they don't understand and they're not strong in this message. I pray, Lord, you'll give them strength. I pray for our brothers and sisters that are questioning and struggling, Father, and, and deciding on the course that they will take, that we will have unity in this movement that we'll have unity based on methodology and parables, based on the light that you're opening up and the work that you're doing. I pray for each person here as they return home. We know that they're going back to, to ministries, uh, whether they're their own family or larger ministry groups, and that they need to um, bring back a representation of what has occurred here. I pray you'll grant them wisdom, that you'll help them to um, represent cautiously and tactfully um, the developments of this camp meeting and that you will open the Jordan before us as you opened for Israel. I pray, Lord, that in this dark time that we will not become discouraged but see the restoration at work. I put all of these things into your hands and I entrust each one of us uh, into, into your safekeeping. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>